virtually all these conversations took place starting around midnight at Kurt's house uh, at, at Sandpoint. And uh, uh, he would wake up at three in the afternoon or so, typically every day, and go about his business. And then, you know, he'd kind of call me that evening and say, hey, okay, I'm ready, come by. And so we'd sit down either in the living room with the TV set on in the background and talk, or we'd be up in the kitchen and uh, his kitchen overlooked this uh, lake um, where uh, uh, biplanes would land sometimes. And we'd just sit at his kitchen table and, and uh, often talk till you know, dawn. And the sun would come up and the biplanes would start landing on the lake and we'd just kick back and, and watch the, the planes come in. There's this very hushed, late night, intimate uh, feeling to those conversations that I didn't even really realized was there because it was just me talking to Kurt, but looking back on it, there's this, you know, it's not like a regular interview situation. It's just two people uh, talking. I first met Kurt through doing a Rolling Stone cover story in, uh, that came out in early 1993. And uh, that was the it's pretty famous Rolling Stone cover where he's, uh, he's wearing a t-shirt that said corporate magazines still suck. And uh, the subhead was uh, inside the heart and mind of Kurt Cobain. And um, I met him when, uh, uh, in retrospect, he was detoxing from heroin after an Australian tour. And he was staying at a place in the, the Fairfax neighborhood of Los Angeles. A few years ago, working on my first film, I worked um, with Michael Azarad, who had written uh, a book about Nirvana called Come As You Are. Um, and I knew he had written the book, but I didn't know that he had um, audio interviews that he had, had held on to with the principals, including Kurt Cobain. Uh, and when I, I heard about this and I, I found out that Michael had wanted to do something with the audio tapes, um, I talked to him and, and said, you know, I have this idea that of doing a movie that would basically just be the audio tapes. I hadn't listened to those tapes since I made them. And I couldn't, I couldn't bear to listen to those tapes since I made them because uh, Kurt and I got to be quite close after the book came out and we did a lot of hanging out and getting to know each other. And uh, listening to them again after all that time, they were recorded on a really good stereo microphone on pretty good tape, you know? And I, when I was making them, I knew that, uh, that he may not be long for this world. To me, it was important not just to have someone who um, was close to Kurt, but also someone who like had a lot of respect for the material that we were dealing with. You know, with 25 hours of tape, um, you know, obviously there's a lot to choose from. But I mean, oddly enough, there's also a lot to cut out right away. You know, when I was writing this book, I I would take quotes from off of these these tapes, and often the quotes that read really well on paper were very different from the ones that were most powerful if you heard them. And it, it's such an amazing and, and it's experience and almost a relief to, to be able to use those quotes that you really had to hear in a project like this. It was this very um, strange thing and, and something that I think is very true about audio in general, audio when not mixed with um, a, a visual accompaniment. Had Michael videotaped these interviews, for example, you'd constantly be remembered of a time period, the way someone dressed, the style of the day. Um, and seeing Kurt, you would have like a, a completely specific idea. Um, listening to the audio is a completely different experience. And what struck me often was that I would forget that I was listening to something that was recorded 12 years ago. I mean, I'd, I've been asked, you know, several times by some really big players over the years to, um, uh, you know, to use my tapes in their project for some reason or another, and and it, it never really felt quite right. Um, partially because, frankly, when when someone kills themselves, the, the reverberations last for a very very long time, and um, it it's it the dust really didn't settle until maybe 10 years later. I mean, it was really that powerful. 
Michael had a lot of opportunities to, to do something with this material in the past, and he had held on to it. He was very protective of it. That was important to me. Um, you know, it really felt like an honor that he trusted me with it. And, and so, you know, I wanted to make sure that the choices that we were making, because as a, as a filmmaker, when you're taking 25 hours of material and you're going to 90 minutes of material, you are creating a certain reality. And it was important to me to make sure that the 90 to 95 minutes that we uh, came up with was reflective of who Kurt was. Well, these three towns, Aberdeen, Olympia, and Seattle, which are very close together, they're, they're like an hour apart driving from one another, but couldn't be more different. They're different in their architecture, they're different in the color palette of the buildings and, and in the stuff that we've shot, they look completely different. Um, but each of these communities says something uh, about who Kurt was. This film had to be shot not only in Washington, but in the towns, cities that he grew up in and the, the, the places that formed him. I think both AJ and I, coming from small towns and now living in Los Angeles, uh, traveling to New York, you know, every place has its own personality and you are greatly developed by, you know, where where you lived. You know, I, I, I actually think it's, it's fascinating that in this state and in a very small corner of this state, there are these three places that are so completely different um, and the people are completely different. We're doing different film stocks in each city um, so that, you know, subconsciously maybe a little bit, you get a little bit of a different feeling from each one. I've known Wyatt for a long time and have always uh, known that he had a great photographic sense. And on, on this project in particular, it was really important to have someone who was also a photographer and understood the photographic nature of what we were doing. After hearing what he did, how he wrote songs, which was to um, not really write them until the moment before he actually, well, he, he would have all the ideas and all the, the uh, lyrics in his head, but when he was right about to go record the song is when he really put them together. So in a way, I just waited till we got here. One of the things that we've done is, is um, to do portraits of people in each of the uh, communities that we've been in. And in, in a way, I think that's the most, one of the most uh, rewarding things that have happened very spontaneously. We've just said like, okay, from this hour, we're gonna pull people and we're going to shoot these portraits of them just looking into the camera. I had Michael Azarad write an introduction to one of my photo books back in the mid 90s. And so we started up a friendship since then. And Michael gave me the heads up that these people were, were possibly going to do a, a Kurt Cobain documentary using the interview tapes that Michael did for Come As You Are and that they might want me to use my old photos or shoot new stuff or I, you know and so I guess the introduction to AJ was really through Michael. From the very beginning, we wanted to um, approach the music in the film slightly differently. Um, and it was something that Michael and I discussed uh, from the first day, which was that the, the music we wanted to use were the bands and the artists that influenced Kurt and that Kurt responded to personally. You can convey things literally, and then there are the things that are between the lines. And when you show a sleepy, shot of Aberdeen at dawn uh, with the huge pine trees and the, the dewy air and the, the, the kind of rural feeling of the town and you hear Kurt's kind of Aberdeen twang and, and maybe you hear the music that he's listening to at the time and you, you experience all three of those things together, I think it's going to add up to more than the sum of its parts. We ended up with an incredible partnership between two people who have never worked together before. Um, Steve Fisk, who produced the first Nirvana EP, and Ben Gibbert, who's um, better known for being in the Postal Service and Death Cab for Cutie. 
Um, and the two of them together, I think, have created an amazing score. Um, and they actually scored to the interviews, which had already been edited together. They did not score to picture, which is an uncommon thing. The idea that that, that we would do the groundwork, that the, that the text was first, that the whole thing was really based on the text, and that was going to, one way or the other, through editing and all the manipulations that go into a documentary, nothing is ever really the truth. You take 14 hours and cut it down to 13 and a half hours and you're omitting things. You cut it down to 90 and while you may have authenticity, Lord knows what the truth is. The truth disappears on the cutting room floor because no one's got the patience to sit through 14 hours of interviews, you know. <laughs> You know, uh, so I like the idea that what is getting distilled to is turning into this thing that was based on the idea of text first, music second, visuals last. Music in the film as well as the imagery and, and Kurt's interviews, it's, it's nice to have so many very strong elements come together um, to create uh, this one, uh, one film. Kurt Cobain was a person just like everybody else. You know, he cried and laughed and loved his child and loved his wife and was frustrated and happy and crabby and jovial and all those things. And uh, I think a lot of that has been taken away from him in the intervening years uh, since his death. He's just become an, an icon and an enigma and, you know, kind of dehumanized. I think that there's a lot of, like a germ of, of an idea of who Kurt was and the things that he believed. And I think there are definitely some misconceptions about him. Um, but ultimately, I think what was important to me about this project was presenting a full picture of a full person. It accomplishes 82% of what it steps out to be. It's still gonna be realer than anything else out there. And that, to me, just in my own rotten little world, you know, I really was very bummed and saddened to see, you know, Kurt turned into this thing even when he was alive. He, you know, he was turning into this, you know, you know, stupid version of himself and expecting him to be this and expecting him to be that. And he is someone who is very well known, but not entirely well understood, which is a very strange thing for being um, as. Um, famous or iconic as he has become. Kurt Cobain is just like some good friend of yours that got in trouble and things didn't work out so well. And it's a sad story. And it's a cool story, but I want people to know that, you know, that was a regular person. Kurt Cobain is a, a guy I knew really well and miss a lot. And um, I hope I do right by him with this movie. <laughs>